So there's a, uh, there's a YouTube video uh, in which Richard Dawkins is in a laboratory setting and there's a giraffe dissection on the table. So what there is in the, in the giraffe is the nerve that goes from the brain to the larynx is unnecessarily long. That is, it goes beyond the larynx and then back up. So this is a video sent to me by a patron where we see a biologist and Christian apologist Rick Gerhardt address one of Richard Dawkins' videos a few years ago. Dawkins dissected a giraffe's neck and found that a branch of the vagus nerve, the laryngeal nerve, took an insane detour down and up the neck of a giraffe in order to reach the larynx, which is very close to the starting point. The argument goes like this. An example of how animals and humans could not have been designed by any sort of intelligence is the length of this nerve. Instead of simply traveling a short distance to the target organ, it goes down the neck to loop around an artery of the heart before ascending back up. This is highly unnecessary and disadvantageous in many situations. For example, this causes some limits to the giraffe's vocal cords, such as the inability to produce high-pitched sounds. However, the phenomenon can easily be explained by evolution. Since evolution doesn't strive to make things perfect, it just makes them work. Evolution can adjust many traits of living organisms to make them more optimal, such as the size of the neck or the size of the heart. What it cannot do, however, is reroute the laryngeal nerve entirely so that it stops looping around the aorta, which is why this finding is quite significant, since it is exactly how we expect it to be. In fact, this looping around the artery evolved when fish transitioned into land animals. They developed to necks, and due to this already present position of this nerve, it had to loop around the aorta. This is consistent, since fish and other sea animals do not have this unnecessary looping. And like I mentioned already, evolution cannot redirect the nerve through a huge blood vessel. Now this nerve isn't the only example we have, in fact there are plenty of them, but let's hear what Rick has to say first. Okay, so my first response would be there's a problematic mixing of tenses here. Okay, would expect is, is a mixing of tenses. Uh, when we expect or predict something, it usually has a future realization. Either it will happen in the future or we will discover it in the future. I expect when I get home that my kids won't have done the dishes. Okay? But there's a future connotation to it. No, there isn't always a future connotation to it. We are saying if evolution were true, we would expect to find imperfections in humans and animal bodies. If the universe was created by an intelligent designer, we would expect to find something designed to the best possible degree. This just means that in order to prove the first premise, in this case evolution, premise 2 must be true. For example, I could say something like, I left some cake in the fridge when I left the house. If my brother ate the cake, I would expect to find the cake missing from the fridge when I get home. In this case, in order to prove that my brother ate the cake, I would have to find the cake not be present. It's not a mix-up of tenses, not at all. Of course, that doesn't exactly mean that the cake disappearing definitely proves that my brother ate it. It would just say that it is a possibility and we cannot rule it out. For an intelligent designer, we would expect everything to be perfectly designed as if an engineer did so. The fact that we find something like the vagus nerve making such a long detour shows that intelligent designer did not design the bodies of humans and animals. But since we expect that for evolution, we can't use this to say evolution is false like we can for an intelligent designer. Uh, the fact is that evolution did not predict that we would find such an arrangement in the giraffe's neck. Rather, it's, it's something evolutionists have discovered and in an ad hoc, after the fact manner, chosen to glob onto as evidence in support of their theory. The fact is that evolution won't produce perfect organisms. Something could go wrong, but instead of correcting it, evolution only needs to make it work. That's how natural selection can select traits to be passed on. Therefore, it is unreasonable to say that everything in nature would be perfect. Somewhere, there would be an imperfect structure that may hinder function, but ultimately works. Even if this was discovered after proposing the theory of evolution, the important part is that it is still compatible with evolutionary theory and not intelligent design. It doesn't matter which came first skeptics of evolution would point out that it is unfalsifiable in that no matter how contrary the evidence proves to be, evolutionary theory has a way of morphing to, to not only explain away that contrary evidence, but actually to, to claim it as support of the evidence. Okay, I can actually see what you're saying here. It seems that whatever we discover in nature, we try to explain it away with evolutionary theory. And there may be some trial and error, but we ultimately use evolution to explain the phenomenon. Sure, this does happen, but that doesn't mean it's not falsifiable, because it is. For example, if we showed that fossils were not laid down in the rock layers that perfectly mapped out our tree of evolution, or perhaps that bacteria don't develop antibiotic resistance, or how about debunking every single speciation event we have directly observed. The fact is, there are plenty of ways to falsify 
by evolution, but so far it has stood up to all this rigorous testing and prevailed. That's why it's our leading idea in natural history. My, my second response is that you will notice that this is not a scientific argument. It's a philosophical or, or even a theological argument. Gonna have to completely disagree, but let's keep going. Dawkins is a theoretical scientist, but he's not making even a scientific claim. He's, he's making a claim about God. God wouldn't do the, that this way. It's, it's a theological argument. Well, no, actually, we're not saying God wouldn't do it this way. In fact, this is just a reactionary response to when creationists say, oh, look, everything in nature is perfect. We're just demonstrating that it's not. If you want to call it a philosophical argument, go ahead, but don't act as if we started this line of thinking. You theists started by calling God an intelligent designer who makes everything perfect. We're just using that to demonstrate that you're wrong. But ultimately, it doesn't matter how this argument began. What matters is what your counter-argument is. But, but for now, my point is just that it's not a scientific argument. It's a theological argument, a philosophical argument, and Dawkins' expertise is in neither of those arenas. First of all, why does it matter if you label this as a philosophical argument or a scientific argument? Second of all, even if it is a philosophical argument, Dawkins can still make arguments based on it. Just because he's not a philosopher doesn't mean he can't talk about philosophy. Let's hear some real rebuttals now. The third thing I would point out is that this claim... Uh, kind of assumes a godlike understanding of, of the situation. Okay, Dawkins says, I see no purpose for this extra length to the laryngeal nerve, but really he's saying, therefore, I, I, I've, I've completely exhausted the possibilities and come to the conclusion that there is no such purpose. So it's, a, it, it's really nothing more than a subjective claim, an opinion, if you will. Ooh, okay, well, you're a biologist. You should know this line of thinking. When we say that we see no purpose, it really means that we've studied this intensively and we can safely conclude that there is no real purpose or benefits. It's like when we say there's no causation between vaccinations and autism. What, just because we can't find the link doesn't mean it's not there? No, in this case, we can safely conclude that vaccinations don't cause autism. In science, we work to disprove the null hypothesis. If we fail to disprove the null, then the null is accepted to be true. It's just an aspect of the scientific method that you should be familiar with. In this case, the null is that there is no purpose in the length of this nerve. Since we haven't found any evidence that shows there is a purpose, the null is automatically accepted. Come on, dude, you're a biologist. Think like a biologist. The fourth point I would say is that it can never be any more than that. That is, we can discover design in the laryngeal nerve. We could, we could discover why there's compromise and added length for some, some purpose of compromise, or we could discover that there's actually an optimization there that we don't currently realize. We could refute Dawkins' claim, but we can never validate or prove it. It will never be more than a subjective claim. <laughs> <laughs> so this is essentially the same as your previous point. Look, if you can provide some f***ing evidence or argumentation on why this nerve needs to be this long, please provide it to us. But until then, we're going to assume there isn't one. Uh, the fifth point I would make is that this type of claim, which in, in hundred letter, a uh, hundred dollar words is a, the claim of dysteleology, bad design, has a very poor track record. That is, every time evolutionists or atheists have offered up an example of bad design in living things, further research has shown eloquent design or compromise or optimization, which makes it very clearly why it was designed such as it is. I haven't kept up much with these specific examples, so feel free to let me know some of them in the comment section below. The only ones I'm currently aware of are the laryngeal nerve and the retina of the eye, and those are pretty powerful ones. Of course, I could probably think of a few in my head just in the human body alone, but I'll do that for another video. Currently, creationists have already tried to address the laryngeal nerve problem, but haven't yet been able to effectively provide a convincing argument. I've heard some creationists try to argue how the laryngeal nerve had to route around the heart due to development structures before birth. 
And yeah, that's pretty much exactly what happens. But that doesn't explain why the creator had to position the nerve to start development on the other side of the aortic arc. The point is, there are better, more thought out arguments that creationists have made, even though they're wrong, and yet the only thing this biologist could come up with is, meh, it could have been a beneficial function, we just don't know it yet. You see how weak this argument is? Address the problem directly, don't tiptoe around it and say, well, we don't know, so God did it. We could talk about the inverted retina in the vertebrate eye. Used to be a classic uh, filler for this claim. Okay, so let's talk a bit about the eye, just briefly. The retina of the human eye has such poor structure. Firstly, the photoreceptor cells are reversed, which leaves the cell bodies to act as an obstruction of oncoming light. Second, the position of the optic nerve connecting to the eye is in a position that would create a blind spot. Other animals that evolved eyes in a separate pathway do not have this problem, supporting our tree of evolution. Third, the retina is easily detachable due to the blood vessels not being in the correct side of the retina. This easily causes blindness amongst people in the world. And the best part is, these problems don't exist for animals that have superior vision, such as the octopus or gastropods. They evolved eyes independently from mammals. Now, you claim that these have been debunked, but so far I haven't seen anything convincing. So you're going to continue by telling us exactly why our thought process is incorrect, right? Right? Or uh, the panda's thumb, which actually was the title of a book by evolutionist Stephen Jay Gould. Well, subsequent research shows that the that the wrist arrangement of, of the panda is perfectly designed for stripping bamboo, which is all it eats all day long. Well, the story isn't exactly how you're portraying it. The panda's supposed thumb isn't a real thumb, but rather is a protrusion from the wrist to make it better for stripping leaves off bamboo. The argument states that if an intelligent designer had designed the panda, he or she would have just given the panda real thumbs, which are much more effective at not only stripping leaves, but also for various other tasks as well. Evolution, however, would give us properties that aren't 100% optimal, but nonetheless serves its purpose, and that's what we see here with the panda's thumb. So there's a very poor track record of this sort of argument from dysteleology. Nah. The sixth point I would make, and, and I'll reserve the right to make another point or two, you know, if we think about it a little longer, but if we did try to uh, help Dawkins out here and turn this subjective claim into an actual argument, what we would discover is that it commits uh, a clear fallacy, and that is it, it, it is a non sequitur. The conclusion doesn't follow from the premise. If we grant that the laryngeal nerve of the giraffe is in fact nothing but a bad design, that doesn't lead to the, it cannot lead to the conclusion that there's no design involved at all. Sure, that doesn't mean there definitely isn't a conscious designer, but it would suggest that this designer isn't intelligent. So in this case, that means it's not your Christian god, but probably some other god we aren't aware of. Unless you are willing to admit that your god isn't all that smart, in which case, why worship him? If evolution of the sort that Richard Dawkins defends and promotes is true, and if I were charged with, you know, coming up with glitzy YouTubes that would, would show everybody why they should believe in evolution, I would like to think that I could come up with an argument that is A, scientific, not theological, uh, B, falsifiable, rather than merely subjective opinion, uh, I'd like to think I could come up with an argument that is uh, cogent or valid rather than fallacious. Well, even if you think those things, at least he made a clear and direct point. You haven't really addressed the argument at all about the laryngeal nerve. I'm sure everyone would rather you go directly in and tell us what purpose the length of the nerve would serve for humans and for giraffes. That would spark an interesting biological discussion. Anyway, that's the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed it, even though it's a bit lengthier and littered more with scientific explanations. I have a few awesome things planned in the next few weeks, so be sure to stay tuned for that. Bye.